We're in our series of messages on prayer. Can't think of a better way to introduce it than with this little brief video this morning, so pay close attention. Life without prayer. And that's exactly the truth. I mean, so many times we uh, moving through life and navigating the courses of decisions we have to make every day and we keep choosing wrong and making bad decisions and bad mistakes and forget that the way we really supposed to navigate this world is with our eyes open towards God. We'll see things differently. What the apostle Paul meant when he said, we look at eyes we do not look at things that, that are present. We look at things that are not seen. And these are the eyes of faith. When we look at things that are not seen, those eyes are opened up in prayer. When we really start seeing what God wants to do and how God works in our life. Last week, we talked about uh, prayers that die, the kind of prayers that don't get any further than the prayer uh, room or, or in front of others, how they might be prayed. But, and then we talked about some reasons we need to pray. I want to continue with that kind of theme today. You know, the Bible says the, the fervent Righteous prayer of a righteous man avails much. I remember hearing the story at Paul Harvey. Y'all remember Paul Harvey on the radio with the rest of the story? He was telling the story about a lady who pulled up the grocery store and her three-year-old son was with her. And he was much like myself at that age, the cookie monster kind of kid. You know, he always wanted cookies. So she let him know clearly that before he goes into the store that uh, we're not buying any chocolate chip cookies. She took his little three-year-old person and set it in the grocery cart, you know, and the little kid with it rolls into the store and of course sure enough they get down the cookie aisle and he starts seeing the chocolate chip cookies and he says may I please have some chocolate chip cookies she responds no I already told you that we were not I told you you shouldn't even ask so we're not getting any chocolate chip cookies and you go about the store doing some other things and the mother remembers she forgot something on that particular aisle so sure enough they're cutting back through the cookie aisle again he stands up in his little seat this time and says may I please have some chocolate chip cookies no, you cannot have any chocolate chip cookies. Be seated. She finishes up her shopping. She's headed for the checkout lines. And apparently his little mind, he's thinking, this is my last opportunity. So he stands up again. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> May I please have some chocolate chip cookies? To which she responds, no, and sets him down. But yes, the rest of the story is completely entertained and applauding and laughing about it. And uh, the rest of the story is he left with 23 boxes of chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> <laughs> which is a good and important lesson to learn. We must be persistent in our prayers. We don't stop asking. It's amazing we ask in Jesus' name. We'll talk about a little bit more that, that that's not some little magic phrase that we put on the end of our prayers. It's an important part of praying and how we pray our lives and not just for the sake of a form, but what that really means in regard to our prayers. In Matthew chapter six, we talked about some of these verses last week when he said, when you pray, go into the inner room and close your door and pray to your father who's in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret, he will reward you. And last week we dealt with what that reward was for the hypocrites. It says they have the reward in full because they just pray to, to, make, you know, to make an impression and it's all about pride and arrogance. He said, but when you pray, it's not about making an impression with the world. Your impression's made with your heavenly father when you seek his face. So in, deal, in dealing with prayer, we talked about the importance of 
going to God who hears in secret and answers prayer and works in answering prayers. We understand this, and it helps you with your prayer life when you do understand this, is that God desires to meet you. God desires to spend time with you. God wants to hear from you. God, God knows what your needs are. This reward he talks about here is in regard to having prayers answered. The answer to prayer is the reward that he's talking about here. And, and the beautiful thing about this is, is that God knows your need well before you even ask it. God knows your need long before it's ever presented as a prayer petition. And, it, and you're praying to a God who cares for you and loves you. Let me just give you a, a quick overview uh, of, a, of, of how God answers prayer. There's about four things I wanna cover with you this morning. And then I wanna to talk to you about the price we pay when we don't pray. And both this message and last week's message are more introductory. It's to kind of stir your appetite for prayer, to get us back to the realizing the importance of prayer. And later on, the next few Sundays that are ahead of us, we're going to talk about kind of the mechanics, what makes up real prayer and what praying according to the will of God is and what is praying in the name of Jesus and how do we effectively pray for petitions and how does the Bible and, and the promises of God, how does all that play into our prayer life? And we'll talk about those things. But I'm hoping that today's message as well as last week's message are kind of get light of fire under us to get a, uh, an expectation and excitement about spending time with God in prayer. How does God answer our prayer? Well, the Lord answers our prayer several ways. First of all, he answers it sometimes immediately. In Isaiah 65, 24 is that passage where the Lord is speaking to the prophet and he says, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while, this is the beautiful part, while they're still speaking, I will hear. God is saying there are times when I will answer your prayers immediately. Now, probably we've all had times we've had a petition before the Lord. Sometimes there's a critical issue, a, a crisis moment, an emergency moment, and sometimes not. But it's that, that time when we offer to prayer the Lord and God just met the need. I mean, it was just done. And, and, and it's, sometimes we're surprised by it because how fast it is. But God's saying, I know what you're going to ask me. And sometimes the answer is immediately. Sometimes it's not immediate. Sometimes it's delayed. Preferably between these two, I'm a number one kind of guy here on the list. Amen. My gift of patience is not very patient. It's not very long suffering. And I prefer, like most of us, let's see God do it. But sometimes it is delayed. In Luke, it talks about this delay. It says, uh, shall not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? There will be a delay sometimes in getting the answer. Sometimes we don't always understand what it is. One of those elements we'll talk about in a couple of weeks is this issue of spiritual warfare. That when we do pray, that we are entering into an, to an arena that is a spiritual arena. And there are opposing forces in that spiritual arena. Daniel said, you know, he, he was praying and, and the Lord told him later, I heard your prayer 40 days ago and I sent the answer. But then he talks about how the devil was a hindrance to that. We'll talk about how we can be effective in praying against spiritual forces, as the Bible tells us to, so that our prayers are not delayed as long. But there are sometimes it, it might not be in the sovereignty of God. It might not be best to see that answered in that moment. So sometimes it's delayed. Sometimes the Lord answers differently. The second Corinthians passage that's there on the screen, seven through 10, those are the verses where Paul said, I asked the Lord three times to take away this thorn in my flesh. I asked God three times and God answered my prayer, but he answered it differently from what I was praying for. I prayed, he removed it. God said, I answered your prayer. I'm going to give you grace over it and grace in it and grace through it. And sometimes that's the answer that comes. So it's different than what we expect, but God has answered the prayer. We need to have the wisdom to understand that, to know that when God is meeting us in this place of prayer and answering our petitions before him, that, well, I, I, I put this before the Lord, that don't, don't miss the fact that he probably has answered it, but maybe not the way I expected him to answer it. But we must have humility of heart and mind and belief that God knows what's best for our life to accept whatever he's doing in this regard. And it does take faith. It takes the commitment to say, God, I believe you're smarter than I am. And that may be hard for some folks to say, but he is smarter than you are. All right. He's a whole lot smarter than I am. He's a whole lot smarter than you are. He sees every aspect, every facet, every perspective that can be had on my life. He has it. 
He sees it from every angle, upside, downside, backside, front side, side side. I mean, he sees every aspect of my life. Sometimes I don't see all that's going on. And so the Lord answers it differently than what I would have expected. Sometimes, might surprise you, he answers it more than what we ask. Jeremiah 33 is a passage that says, I will show you great and mighty things which I know. You know, about. that's the end of the verse. The first of the verse says this, call unto me. Call unto me and I'll show you great and mighty things that you know not. Ephesians passage is that verse in chapter three, verse 20, where he talks about that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can even think or ask. Now I can ask some things, but the Bible said, but he can do greater than even what I ask. I'll be honest with you. There's times I've prayed, like right now, <laughs> Lord, turn the lights on, please. Since I, don't just look at it. Somebody try to reset. There are times when we pray and we don't, you know, we, we don't think God's answering. And if we hold on long enough and see what God's doing, we'll see that God has done exceedingly abundantly above all we can think or ask. It's over. It's, it's more. I mean, I've asked for something and God has literally blown my minds and revealed more to me than what I could have ever expected God to do. He just does it greater. It's beyond what I could do. It's more than what I could do. It's more than what I could have asked. I think if we get honest long enough and look back, take kind of a, a back step and see just for a moment that God has done more than what I thought he could. You can go ahead and bring those a little brighter if you wouldn't mind. All right, so understand this. He answers immediately, he answers delayed, he answers differently, and sometimes he answers more. There's this great passage by, in, in, in a book called Prayer by Ian e. Bounds, and I, it was so profound when I read it. I wanted to share that with you because it's just a powerful statement. He says, prayer is the channel through which all good flows to men. I'm gonna say that again in case you missed it. Prayer is the channel which all good flows to men. Prayer is a privilege, a sacred privilege. Prayer is a duty an obligation, most binding and most imperative, which should hold us to it. But prayer is more than a privilege and more than a duty. It is the appointed condition of getting God's aid or his help. It is the avenue through which God supplies man's want. Don't miss that. If you miss this, you miss the importance of what prayer is. If you miss this, you miss the, 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 the power that's available to you through asking God and, and praying about things. It is the way that God's gonna meet your needs. It is the way that God's gonna get into your situation by invitation, by participation with him, by communication with him. It's important to say, God, I need more than anything else to hear what you're saying to me and for you to be involved in what I'm doing. I, the Bible makes it very clear in, in many places that for us to navigate this Christian life, for us to really live it, it, it takes more than the energy of our personal flesh. It takes more than our own personal ingenuity of mind. It takes more than just personal strength to make it happen. We need the grace of God and we need the power of God, but it's not going to happen until we, do, until we begin to pray. I really feel we don't understand the power of prayer. It is through prayer. It is through our communication with our Heavenly Father that things happen in the natural that would not normally happen in the natural realm if we hadn't invited God into it. I believe with all my heart that when I pray, supernatural things begin to happen if I pray and when I pray. Now, all prayer, and let me just simplify this even, and this may seem a little too oversimplification, but all prayer has to have two parts. You say, what are the parts? Well, the obvious one is someone to answer the prayer, <laughs> right? God. And we have a God who doesn't just say, I'm your God. He is our Father. We have an intimate family connection with our Heavenly Father. He is our Father, and He stands ready lovingly willing to give to those who seek his face. He is the God over all things. He is the infinite God. He is the all powerful, all seeing, all knowing God. And that God stands ready to minister to me, to meet my needs. He's in place. He's there. And I believe he desires for me to ask him. We see that in passage after passage after passage of scripture, that here's God who is a father who wants to meet the needs of his children. Now the other part, again, may seem like an oversimplification to you, is man to ask and to receive. Two parts, God and man. Now, do we not know that? Oh, Brother Joe, we know that. 
But do we really know it? Because if we really know it, then we'll take on this role of this person, this second part, and be willing to ask God and open our hearts to God and our minds to God so that we can be in a place for God to do something. Your willingness, my willingness to make the time, to take the effort, to make a sacrifice of our time if necessary, to get into a place to speak to God, that is the channel by which God will flow into my life and through my life to the world around me. God's not sitting by to coerce me. God has already graced me. God's already given me his light, his word. The Bible says it gave me his precious promises so I can live the life he's called me to live. So God stands ready. Now he's waiting for me to come and to ask to come and communicate, to come and participate with him. But it takes him on one end and me on the other end. Prayer now becomes, if I understand this, prayer becomes God's opportunity to get in to the world all around me and to get into the world all around you. But what happens? We don't pray. And because we don't pray, because we don't assume the obvious position that scripture gives us to be that part, that man, that woman, to ask, to receive, to believe, to trust. If we don't fall into that, if we don't come up to understand that and come to God and pray, then we, pray, we pay a price, a tremendous price that we suffer because we don't do this. And the price we pay, well, I think, let me just give you several ways. One, the obvious thing is it costs us in three areas. One, you say, well, who's it cost? It costs others. One thing when I came in this week and I've encouraged the staff to come in every day during the week, spend a few minutes in here, at least 15 minutes and, and spend some time at the wall to pray and to pray for your needs. As I've come in here these days, I've discovered there's a lot of needs represented on this wall. And there's, there's some heart wrenching things and some difficult issues and some situations that people are facing that are critical and are hard to deal with. And you are invited to come in as well before this service, stay after the service, come in on Wednesday night before the service. Any time the office hours are open, you're welcome to come in here, come up to the wall, put your prayer petitions on there and pray for some of these others that are there as well. Take some time. But as you do that, you see that there's a lot of people who need God to move in their life. There's a lot of people who are desperate for, for work of God and for a move of the Holy Spirit in their situation or their circumstance and in their life or family or on their job. There's just a multitude of needs that are represented there. Who's going to pray for these? We're called to pray for one another, to bear one another's burdens. And the greatest way that I can bear your burden is to pray for you. And so we come and we lift these needs up to the Lord and we pray for one. But if we don't, then others are suffering. As a result of my own particular lack of discipline or spiritual apathy or whatever it might be, multitudes are hurting people. We can give in more ways than we realize than just our giving and our time. We can give in prayer and God will do great things. We suffer, I believe. You say, what do you mean? If I'm not spending time with God, I'm missing out on the glory of the relationship. God has planned something unique for all of our lives. We talk about the will of God often, but how are we ever going to discover it if we don't spend time with God? You know? I know men hate to ask for directions, but that shouldn't apply to our prayer life. Amen. Amen. We ought to ask for directions there. We ought to spend some time and say, okay, I need to, I need to know which way to turn, Father. I, know which, I, I need to know which way to go in this, in this particular issue of my life, in this particular situation. But if I don't ask, guess what? I miss out on all the glory God has planned for my life. The beautiful, you know, part of the will of God for my life. I, I may enjoy some sprinkling showers of blessing, but I don't think I'm gonna enjoy the full blessings that God has for me. And then, we, here, here's the terrible part. God who has planned things, God who has a, 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 a desire to be fulfilled so that some lives are gonna be changed and hearts are gonna be changed and homes are gonna be changed and I'm gonna be changed. Ultimately, God's plans are thwarted and I become that guilty party. Ultimately, by my, by my sin of omission, just not doing what I'm supposed to do, I become the guilty party of not seeing God's plans put in place on the earth. It's God's will being done, done through us. Jesus, when he taught on prayer, he said, pray like this. It's our, thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is Jesus telling us with that model prayer? We seek God's face so that his will will be carried out. So his kingdom will be established. So God's, what God wants to do in the earth will be done. And it happens here to start with more than anywhere else. 
So there's a price that we pay. And it really gets down, it's the price of rebellion. In 1 Samuel, the prophet is speaking, he says, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. God forbid that I wouldn't pray for you. In other words, he puts it in this place here that if I am not praying for you, then, then it's rebellion. Because even as we shared last week, it's on video if you want to watch it again. <laughs> we talked about the command and the call that God has given to us to pray. The expectation that God has that we pray, that we do seek his face, that we do call on him. He said, Jesus said, when you pray, the clear assumption is that you pray, all right? And when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites, you pray like this. So it's clear that throughout scripture, there's this, this word of God that God's called us. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter, one, chapter 5, verse 17, we should be praying without ceasing. In other words, we don't give up on prayer. Does it mean we pray all the, I believe it means we're always praying in reality. We're always staying in communication while I'm driving, I'm talking to God. When I have decisions, I'm talking to God. Sometimes when I'm talking on the phone to you, I'm talking to God. What do I tell them, Lord? What do, they, you know, <laughs> what do I need to say here? How do I need to respond? And I'm talking to God. So that pretty much is, means we're exposing everything ultimately to the Lord. But hey, if we're not doing that, if we're not turning things, if we're not seeking his will over these things, then it is a price we're gonna pay of rebellion. And I, I'll let you know from experience, God doesn't pour out his greatest blessings on rebellious hearts. God doesn't pour it out on those hearts that are going to rebel against him. Jeremiah 33, 3, when he says, call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things. That is a call to prayer. And it's not, it's not a suggestion. Well, if you look that up in the Hebrew, when that word verb is, it means that God, there's this expectation that God has upon you that you're calling. You don't you know, you, you don't sit back and just ignore what the call is. You answer that call, you respond. And to not answer it, it's a refusal. I mean, it comes down to this. It's a refusal of the promises of God. In, first, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, the Bible tells us very clearly that God has given us great, exceeding, precious promises. And that by these promises, you might be made partakers of the divine nature. What does that mean? That means that you can experience God in your life. How do you do it? Through the promises of God. But how, do, how does that work? I take these promises of God and I present them to God and I stand on them and I believe them and I trust what God has said to me. I look to him. What am I doing in prayer? I'm claiming God's promises so that I won't be deficient and I won't be paying the price of rebellion. So ultimately, if I'm not, then I'm just, I'm thwarting the promises of God. I'm obviously rebelling against what Jesus taught and what he modeled and what he lived through his life on prayer. And it's also a violation of the, the whole spirit of scripture. Scripture is given to us as a covenant, as a book of promise. And it to be, it's to be participated in. It's to be trusted. It's to be voiced to God. It's to be surrendered to God. So there's this price of rebellion. And then I also pray, pay, excuse me, I should pray, the, the price of deficiency. I love this passage in James. He makes it pretty clear in James 4. We have not because we ask not. I couldn't get any simpler than that, right? You have not because you ask not. Now, if you look at the context of that passage, he's talking about prayer, but he's talking about communication in the context. He's talking about people that don't get along and they're arguing instead. He said, you want this and you don't get it. And so you, you argue, you fight, you quarrel with one another. He said, the reason you don't get what, you, what, what your, your desires are is because you don't take it to God. You don't, God doesn't answer you because you don't ask. You have not because you ask not. He said, instead of that, you'd rather fight and quarrel about it. Here's the, here's the healing solution to every family argument or every relationship argument you may be experiencing in your life. Pray about it. Quit fighting about it. Take the hand of your partner and say, let's pray about this. You want your way, I want my way. Let's see what God's way is. Hello. That takes humility, doesn't it? That takes a surrendered heart. That takes a heart that says, I really want God's will over my will. <laughs> and that's hard to come to. But when we come to that, God said, hey, you won't be, you know, you won't be walking around with deficiencies in your, in, your, in your life. So you have not because you have not. In other words, God says, I'm ready to supply. There's that God on the other end again. I'm ready to supply. He is the supply. Well, what if I don't ask? You know, James 1 and it says in verse five, this is before chapter four, same book, same letter. James one says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask God who will give it to you liberally, bountifully, and he won't withhold it. 
Ask. I need wisdom. I need direction. I need discernment. Ask. But I need wisdom. I need direction. I need discernment. Ask. I think I can figure this out. No, ask. I'm a pretty smart guy. You're not that smart. <laughs> all right. Ask God. And if you ask God, God says, I'll give you that. That's, that's a quick one. All right. That's a, that's a quick answer. I'll give you direction. I'll give you insight. I'll give you wisdom. Revival. We're always saying, oh, Lord, send revival. The church needs revival. The Bible says we can have revival. If my people, those are the ones who, that's the other end of the God man thing. If my people, which are called by my name, that's believers, if they will humble themselves and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, God says, you know, fast. If, 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 you, if you just, here's the simple thing, but you got to start with asking. Yes. I'll send revival. Brother Joe, why aren't we having revival? You aren't asking. And this is the matter of asking with a heart that's right and asking with pursuit and asking with passion, asking the point we're willing to fast, to pray, to see God's face. But we don't have it, he said, because you don't, you don't, you don't ask. A lot of times people come, Brother Joe, I just need, I need to be filled with power and boldness. I just, I'm so deficient in my spiritual life. I just feel, I just don't have, I just, you know, what, what? Jesus said, hey, if you need the spirit, ask your heavenly father. And your heavenly father will give you the spirit. In fact, he says, how much more should your heavenly father give the spirit to those who ask? In other words, if you need God's anointing on your life, God's power on your life, God's boldness on your life, courage to face the fears of your life, he says, you ask God and he'll give you, he'll fill you with his Holy Spirit. He said, he's your father. This is the lesson Jesus gave. He's your father. If you ask a father for some bread, he's not going to give you a snake or a serpent or a stone. He's going to give you his spirit. So I can come to the father and say, God, I need to be filled with the spirit to face these issues, the dilemmas of my life. Well, how can I ask? What about your basic necessities? Oh, I can take care of that. No, you can't. Jesus said, don't do that. Jesus said, hey, yeah, you do what you're supposed to do. And you, you, you know, the scriptures teach the principle of work. So, but here's what you do in regard to really seeing your needs met. He said, well, he modeled it for us when the disciples, you know, when he's teaching the disciples about prayer. And he said, pray like this. And he went on to talk about our Father, which art in heaven, the kingdom come. But then he says, give us this day our, our what? Our daily bread. So the necessities of my life are a reference there. And Jesus very clearly says, ask God. Ask God. Now, some of you are going through living in Houston, the changes of the economy up and down and in and out. It's new job after another job after this shop closed and that building closed, that oil industry closed. And you've had, to, you've had to learn this lesson. Well, maybe you haven't had to learn it yet. That's why you keep losing your job. <laughs> but you have to learn this lesson in real life, right? But that's when the Lord teaches it to us in real life. Now, the tragedy is that we'd go through those kind of experiences and not learn the lesson. Are you still with me? Yes. You almost are. The price of deficiency. And by the way, that when we talk about temptation, and I talk to people about this a lot. They say, Brother Joe, I just have this temptation. It seems so overwhelming. It seems so struggle. I'm doing something I shouldn't do. Watch something I shouldn't watch. You're going someplace you shouldn't go. What do I do about that? Jesus said, ask. In fact, in James, when he's talking about prayer, about wisdom, you know what he's talking about specifically? He's talking about temptation. And by the way, you'll find it extremely, impossibly difficult to face your temptation and be praying and still fulfill the temptation desire. Because right. you can't do both things. So what do I do when I'm tempted? You face God, and you face God with that temptation. And the Bible tells us this in more than one place is you watch and you pray when facing temptation. You watch and you pray when facing demonic forces. You pray, you trust God, you believe. So you're not praying the price of deficiency. The second area in, in this regard, the third, fourth, whatever, the, power, the price of powerlessness. This is where it gets back to what I said about the Holy Spirit empowering our lives. You say, oh, Brother Joe, I was filled with the Holy Ghost back in 1973. That was good for that day in 1973. What about today? When the Bible says be filled with the Spirit, it has to do with a daily process of surrendering our life, committing ourselves to Christ, dying to the old man, lifting up that resurrected life and say, today I belong to Jesus and today I need you to empower my life and today I need you to, to strengthen my life. If you follow the course of history, you'll see that the great saints of God of old were people who prayed. There's that quote that, that I have on the screen. It says, the prayerless person is the spiritual undertaker of all God's truth. Isn't that the truth, though? If we don't pray, we're not claiming the truths of God. If we don't pray, then we don't have the power going up. We don't have the strength. We'll fall at every temptation. We'll fall into every sin. We'll fall at every suggestion from the enemy. Instead of living this powerful, resurrected life, we don't. 
Look at the scriptures. Look at the men of the Old Testament. Look at the Elijahs, you know, and the Daniels and the Shadrachs and the Meshachs and Abednego. And you see how their lives were surrounded like David with prayer. And they're powerful because of it. Look in the New Testament at Paul, at Peter, at the, at the times of persecution when it says that when they were being tremendously persecuted, they got together and they prayed and God shook the place and gave them boldness and gave them power. You go to the history of the church, whether it's early church fathers or the later church leaders like Luther and Finney and Moody and Tozer and Spurgeon. They were all men of great prayer. They spent time with God. If you read their testimonies, if you read their biographies, they'll tell you, we prayed, we sought God, we trusted the Lord. I, I think it gets down to this right here. It's not that we do not believe in the importance of prayer. We just don't know the priority, the primacy of prayer. We just don't really believe how important it really is. Yeah, we ought to pray, we ought to pray. The Bible says all men everywhere lift up holy hands praying. I don't think we see just how really of a necessity it is in our life. This is something we need. I need to pray more than I need a car. I need to pray more than I need a job. I need to pray more than I need a house or I need clothing. Because that will be the channel by which everything else comes to me, right? The most important thing we can do in the church is pray. The most effective thing that we can do. I read this particular quote and listening to sermons on prayer of the years and I wrote it down. I, I don't even remember where I got it. It's just some notes I'd, I'd scribbled out on prayer. And it said this, you can do more than pray after you've prayed. Got that? You can do more than pray after you've prayed. But you can not do more than pray until you've prayed. That doesn't make any sense. In other words, we can't do anything of real power, of eternal value, of lasting influence until we pray. Samuel Chadwick put it this place. The one concern of the devil, the one concern of the devil is this, to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our labors or toils. He mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. He trembles when we pray. I remember the Frank Peretti author who put out the series of, of, of novels, you know, fictitious novels on, on prayer and warfare praying, and they were great novels. And, but I, I remember the introduction to the, I think it was the first book called Piercing the Darkness. And I remember in the introduction, these angels are walking by this church. That's the way the author writes it. And as they're going by the church, they kind of turn up the sidewalk, and as they're coming to the sidewalk, boy, some demons are being thrown out and tumbling into the dirt and running off into the dark, screaming. And they get inside, and there's one person, the pastor of this little church, is on his face at the altar, and he's praying. One of the angels said to the other, he doesn't look like much to me. Probably what they say about you and me, huh? He doesn't look like much to me. But the other angel says, ah, oh, but he prays. That's what impresses heaven. That's what impresses God. Because prayer is faith. Prayer is saying, I believe God is the answer. I believe, I believe God is bigger than the devil. I believe that God is bigger than my situation. I believe that God is bigger than the circumstance. I believe that God's bigger than the problem. You know? Bigger than all of it. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus and I want to know how to inherit the kingdom of heaven. The Lord spoke to him and finally dealt with him about his biggest sin of all, which he didn't want to deal with, which is his covetousness and his greed. And it says when he wouldn't sell all and follow Jesus, that he left and walked away sorrowful. Now, in the mind of the Jewish mindset and of the culture and the philosophy of the times was if you're blessed like that young man to be rich and young and a ruler, to have that kind of blessing, he said God had blessed him. And God had blessed him in spite of himself. But he abused the blessings of God. So Peter turns to Jesus and said, well, if he can't be saved, then who can be saved? The red letter edition in red letters puts it this way. With man is not possible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, that's the Greek language translated to the English. There's a little preposition, W-I-T-H, with, and in the context of the Greek language, it's a unique preposition not just an ordinary prayer. It's a unique preposition that literally means face to face. You 
In other words, you get your face in God's face, all things are possible. All things are possible. See what God does when we get this point. There's that great passage when the disciples are turning to Jesus and Jesus is communicating. It said it happened that while Jesus was praying in a secret place after he'd finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples to pray. Now, this is towards the later part of the ministry of the Lord Jesus. These guys had seen Jesus do some incredible things. They'd seen Jesus do things that were beyond the natural. They, they had been there when the water was turned to wine. They had been there at the Sermon on the Mount and heard the most powerful words of the message and the anointed words of Jesus preached by the Son of God. They'd seen Jesus condemn the self-righteous. They had seen Jesus encourage the woman that the Pharisees had brought and she was caught in adultery and Jesus had told her, you know, to go and sin no more. They had been there for each of these events. They were on the boat. These these guys asking this question were on the boat when Jesus walked on the water. They were in the boat. They saw that firsthand. These were the guys who heard the words of Jesus when he told the waves and the wind to be still and it responded. These are the guys who saw Jesus bless a piece of bread and some fish and feed 5,000 people only a few days later to bless some other few bits of food and feed thousands more again. These are the guys who watched Jesus cast out demons. These are the guys who'd seen Jesus raise the dead. These are the guys who Jesus uh, said, you know, this is my father's will and carried out in front of them. They saw over and over again. But catch this. They didn't ask Jesus how to raise the dead. And they didn't ask Jesus how to break bread so that it feeds 5,000. They didn't ask Jesus for lessons on water walking because they saw everything he did was a result of this first thing that he did. Jesus always went and met with the Father. And it's after those events that you see these things happen over and over again. And when he finishes one event, you see him going back to spend time with God. That's why they say, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. That's why we come back to as a church often and visit this subject and this matter again. You've heard sermons on prayer. You've read books on prayer. But as, Paul, as Peter told the church, I want to stir up your minds by way of remembrance. You remember the importance of what's going on here. It's about having the Father's will being done. I want you to pray. I want you to pray. If Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He's still desiring to teach his disciples to pray. His disciples just need to have the same attitude as the originals. Teach us to pray. Give us a heart. We've been coming to the altar this last Sunday, and I want to encourage you to do it again. There should still be the prayer bracelets and the prayer sheets and the pens and the little sticky notes that we started with last week to pray. I'm going to ask those of you who would like today to have a prayer need and a prayer request that you would take it and come to the altar this morning and pin it out on those paper, take it over the wall, stick it on there and have a word of prayer over it. And others will be following up in like suit to pray over it. Maybe you weren't here last week. We put the wall up. We put the bands out to remind us to be prayer warriors. If you haven't picked up one of these bands and you're not wearing it regularly, get one and start wearing it. I'm gonna, I've asked people to commit to at least seven or eight weeks of this, nine weeks of this, to wear these prayer bands to remind yourself, hey, I need to spend time with God today. It's so easy to get up and run off and just, you know, you say, I don't have time for God. Hey, you got time for a hamburger. You got time for God. You got time for McDonald's. You got time for God. Amen. You got time for NBC, ABC, and all the other C's. You got time for God. You need to make time. You need to take time. You invest that time. This is where God moves in your life. This is your avenue. This is your access. So I want to encourage you to do so. In fact, I'd like us to stand together with our heads bowed. This morning, if you do have a prayer need, don't hesitate. Come to the altar today.